Uh, I'm here to introduce Dan Levitin. Uh, so he's here today to talk about his new book, which was originally published in hardcover under the title Field Guide to, to Lies, which is uh, why it was advertised that way. But the paperback just came out like this week or Tuesday, and they retitled it Weaponized Lies, wonder why, uh, to make it a little bit more trendy. Dan Levitin to talk a lot more about lies. Thank you. Well, thank you all. I'm, I'm delighted to be back at Google. Um, I want to talk about the current state of facts and pseudo-facts in the world and perhaps in the White House. Um, I feel that, well, one of the reasons we reissued my book in paperback with this updated title is what I want to talk about. I, I'm beginning to feel that our country is in a crisis that could possibly set us back 400 years. And I know that sounds dramatic, and I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about reversing the age of reason, which ushered in a period of unprecedented intellectual, economic, cultural, and social growth. The Enlightenment, as it is also called, drew a line in the sand between rumor and fact, between testable hypotheses and anecdote and between demonstrable facts and nonsense. Prior to the age of reason, uh, people who heard voices in their heads might have been burned at the stake or drowned as witches. Uh, by the 20th century, that we, we had identified a biological disease called schizophrenia that causes these voices in the head. Uh, we've developed drugs to treat it. The age of reason led us to the germ theory of disease, penicillin, and although it took us a while and still isn't ubiquitous, women's rights, child labor laws, and a reduction in racist attitudes around the world, all thanks to the age of reason, uh, to evidence-based thinking. But until the last few months, I think, it, it allowed us as citizens to engage in a constructive discussion with elected officials and public policy ma makers about public policy matters and these discussions largely were based on facts, on evidence that everybody agreed to. When I was a kid, if you ran into somebody, you know, the proverbial stranger in the street, somebody at a bus stop, and you wanted to talk about the news, uh, forget when I was a kid, all the way through my 30s and 40s, you run into a stranger, you could be pretty sure that if you wanted to talk about the news, they had the same news that you did. There was a limited number of places you could get the news from, and you might have differed in your views about how a particular fact should be handled or dealt with, or what the best way to solve unemployment might be, or the best way to solve crime, but you didn't disagree about the numbers underlying crime or unemployment. But as you know, the White House uh, gave, well, President Trump in particular, gave wildly different estimates of the unemployment rate, all in one sentence. It varied, he said, between 4.5% and 43%, depending on how you measured it. Now, that, that, one of those numbers is clearly nonsense, uh, and I think undermines the ability of us as citizens to have any kind of constructive dialogue about unemployment if the numbers can't be agreed upon. Uh, if the current administration is going to brand as fake facts that they find inconvenient, it undermines the entire political system. If we're going to throw out facts as a prerequisite to discussion, we're reversing centuries of cognitive progress. Now, again, I don't see this as a political matter. Uh, it's not about Republican or Democrat or Green Party or Libertarian. Um, and it's not about this particular White House. It's about uh, an attitude that facts don't matter. And I think they do. Uh, I think evidence matters. If you're going to build roads, and you've got a particular county that you want to put those roads in, you, it would be helpful to know whether you actually need roads there or not. Are there drivers there? Are, there? are the roads that are there not serving us well? This is you know, the kind of data collection that many of us do for a living. Uh, evidence matters. The reason I'm calling the book Weaponized Lies is that some of these distortions and fake news and things that we've seen over the last few months some of them have, you know, first of all, words matter. Uh, I don't like calling, I don't like words like alt-truth or alternative facts or fake news because I think they're just euphemisms for lies. 
Uh, there, there are no alternative facts. There, there are facts, and then there are things that are not facts. There's evidence, and then there's stuff that's not. Um, fake news bothers me because there's nothing newsy about it. Uh, there's no news in it. And calling it fake almost sounds a little too playful. It, you know, like a kid tried to get out of going to school because he or she is sick. I mean, you know, faking illness. I mean, but let's call them what they are. They're lies. And these lies have become weaponized. In our lifetime, the original weaponized lie was the lie that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, which actually led us into a war. That's what I mean by a lie that becomes weaponized. Or how many of you heard the story that Hillary Clinton was operating a child sex slave operation out of the back of a pizza store in suburban Washington, DC? Is this familiar to you? Uh, it turns out that this, this is a lie. It, it was traced to a Macedonian teenager who made it up just to get the click-through revenue on advertising. That lie had a million hits when Snopes.com and other sources uh, revealed it to be a hoax, that story got 35,000 hits. One of the people who believed the, the lie drove from North Carolina to DC with an assault rifle to investigate and then actually discharged the weapon at the pizza place, not finding any evidence but feeling that he had to do something. Uh, and so again, the lie became weaponized. And I think all of us have to stop and take a breath and figure out what we can do to stop the promulgation of this kind of nonsense. And I think that's what, in, in, at least in some broadly writ fashion, that's what all of you do for a living, is trying to stop nonsense and to get data and evidence into the world. That's what Google's about. Uh, and I think e even apart from Google, outside of Google, uh, all of us have a personal responsibility as citizens of a free country to try and keep the conversation on track. Now, why does any of this matter uh, to you in your own life? Maybe you're not political. Maybe you don't want to get involved. Maybe you're just uh, trying to figure out how to get by one day at a time. And I'll tell you why it matters. Because evidence-based thinking in your personal life, setting aside the public sphere, uh, it's correlated with a number of important outcomes. Evidence-based thinking is associated with conscientiousness, which is a factor that's been shown to correlate very highly with increased longevity, fewer health problems, more life satisfaction, and in a very real fashion, being able to engage in evidence-based thinking will save you time. You'll be able to make decisions more quickly. You won't have to recover from bad decisions, which always takes a lot longer than having made a good decision the first time out. Uh, especially decisions about your health care or where to invest your retirement money. Evidence-based thinking helps there. For those of you that have children or younger brothers and sisters, um, this kind of thinking will help them get better grades in school and to do better on their papers and assignments. Um, Non-evidence-based thinking has actually had a very dire and very local consequence. Just not to put too fine a point on it, but you all know that Steve Jobs died of pancreatic cancer. What isn't as widely known is a little bit of the nuance about the treatment that he chose. So when faced with the opinions of medical experts, um, Steve Jobs decided, um, look, Steve Jobs was clearly a brilliant man, right? But he didn't make an evidence-based decision, which he later admitted towards the end of his life. Rather than go with traditional Western medicine, he decided to follow an alternative medicine regimen, which, uh, you know, changing his diet and getting exercise and things like that were going to beat the pancreatic cancer. Well, by the time he realized that it wasn't working, the cancer had progressed to such a degree that Western medicine could no longer help him. And he died. And, and he admitted that he had made an error in judgment there by not going with the evidence. Now, I've been a little bit sloppy with my language here by referring to traditional Western medicine and what he pursued as alternative medicine, because really there's no such thing as alternative medicine. I, might, I know that I may make some of you mad by saying that. I know that Silicon Valley is ground zero for alternative health, but uh, as is Marin County, I suppose. I got chewed out when I talked about this in Novato recently. Um, but the way I look at it, alternative medicine is a non sequitur. It's not like there are two kinds of medicine and one is running in parallel to the other. There's medicine, 
which has been proven to work, and then anything for which we have no evidence, we call alternative medicine. And then, as soon as it's been shown to work, it becomes medicine, right? Alternative medicine is simply the category of things that we have no evidence for. So to, to call it alternative medicine, like calling something fake news, kind of elevates it to a dignity that I don't think it deserves. The problem, of course, with lies and um, distortions of truth is that they can lead you down the wrong path. And you know, getting back to the age of reason, it was Voltaire who said, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. And this is what I think all of us need to have, uh, make a concerted effort to change about the way uh, the current public discourse is going. Part of the problem, too, is that there's been a balkanization of news sources. As I said earlier, it used to be most of us got all our news from a few sources. And sure, there was some crank. If you went into a city like San Francisco and you went into um, you know, Market Street, there'd be some crank on the corner with a, a sandwich board saying the world is coming to an end, or he might be yelling into a bullhorn that there's a terrible conspiracy, that uh, you know, the CIA is, is spreading germs in the atmosphere to keep us all docile or whatever. And you knew because it was a guy with a sandwich board and a, and a bullhorn, you knew it was a crank. The problem is now those cranks have turned to the internet and it's very difficult to tell because, you know, face it, any 11-year-old can make a website that looks professional, as professional as that of General Motors or Ford Motors or, you know, a big American company. Uh, and it's harder because we don't have the traditional cues telling us. I grew up in, in the East Bay, and we had some crank in our community when I was a kid who had a little printing press in his basement with rubber type, and he'd print out these screeds and put them in front of everybody's door. And you knew from the kind of tilty type and the uneven inking uh, that this was not a professional operation, which didn't mean he wasn't right, but I believe in playing statistics. The statistics are the New York Times and the San Francisco Chronicle were more likely to be right than this guy who was printing off stuff in his basement, who might have been right about, about things once in a while, but then sooner or later, you know, the Chronicle would pick up on it, and then I would read about it for realsies. Uh, but this balkanization of the news media has left us without the traditional gatekeepers and checks and balances. People get their news from all different sources, and when they're talking to each other in the street or online or through social media, they're dealing with what they think are different facts. I want to clarify, there are not different facts. There's a set of facts, but there are different opinions, and then there's nonsense being promoted as fact. I think that um, all of us need to take seriously President Obama's parting words. Again, I, I, I don't intend for this to be political. I, I imagine that it may sound political to some of you. I consider myself um, to be um, nonpartisan and down the center in, in most issues. Um, I think that one of the tests of the fact that I am nonpartisan is that I've gotten an equal number of angry letters about this latest book from people on the right and people on the left, each of them accusing me of being a partisan for the other side. So I, I must be doing something right. Uh, so I, I'm mentioning Obama not because I favor Democratic elected officials, but I think his words were wise. Uh, in his exit speech, he said that democracy takes work, that you, you, know, you can't just take it for granted. Each of us has to contribute in some way. It was his call for us to be involved. And Obama wasn't saying only get involved if you're going to be a Democrat. He was saying get involved, follow, follow your beliefs. And I believe that we all need to be more involved in supporting three institutions that are vital to the future of our democracy. One of them is the free and independent press. I think we need to support them by subscribing, by um, backing them up when they're, uh, being, uh, when they're attempts to silence them. I was gratified to see that instead of backing down after Sean Spicer's first press conference, the press actually doubled down, and they're, they're working harder. The New York Times um, did a lot of soul searching about their failures in the fall. I know that uh, the Chronicle is, the San Francisco Chronicle, and I know that um, a number of other publications have. The New York Times issued a scathing internal report in which they admitted to a number of failures, and as a result, they're hiring um, more reporters with diverse backgrounds. 
They're hiring more editors with diverse backgrounds. They're ensuring that New York Times reporters and editors have better training. And they're making an effort to um, address voices that might not have been heard in the New York Times. Just in the last two weeks, the New York Times, which has a leftist bent, uh, in the last two weeks I read a pro-life um, pro anti-abortion op-ed, which you never would have seen uh, in, you know, in the last couple of decades in the Times, and I read a pro-Steve uh, pro Bannon op-ed. Steve Bannon's not bad, this is why he's good. Uh, so they're making an effort to address a broad readership. I think they need to do that. We need to support the free press. The other institution is the judiciary. We need to support an independent judiciary, uh, which functions as a separate branch of government and engages in evidence-based thinking. It was no accident. It was telling that when the federal judges view, uh, reviewed the uh, tr original Trump immigration ban, the phrase that stuck out was, there is no evidence that these seven countries are um, you know, posing a danger to us. They are evidence-based. Now, you can, uh, the third institution is uh, science. Scientists, the scientific method. Scientific method believes in collecting data, withholding judgment until uh, you have a preponderance of evidence, uh, rigorously assessed, peer-reviewed. Now, certainly, um, all of you can complain that these are imperfect systems. You know of corrupt journalists. You've heard about journalists making up stories. You've heard of corrupt judges. Uh, you know that there are corrupt scientists. In my own field, in cognitive neuroscience, we've had two or three terrible um, episodes in the last few years where leading scientists in our field admitted to making up data. Um, Harvard scientists, we read in the 60s, took money from the sugar industry in order to uh, play down the bad health effects of sugar. Yes, there are corrupt people in all these institutions, but they're the best we've got, and they're self-correcting. They eventually root out the corruption, uh, and when they work, they work to sustain democracy. Th think of judges. The, you know, the whole idea of an independent judiciary is they're not beholden to special interests. They protect the weak from the powerful. They protect the poor from the rich. They protect people who might be from underrepresented or disenfranchised communities from the majority. That's the way it's supposed to work. Again, there are corrupt judges, there are biased judges, uh, but that doesn't mean we throw out the whole system. Another big point I'd like to make is that I think we need to, uh, as a society, as a community, and especially here at Google, Start thinking a little more carefully about experts and venerating experts. There's a kind of culture in the country right now of being suspicious of them. Uh, and that, that has led to the current climate of fake news and alternative facts, I think. Um, and I think we scientists share some of the blame here uh, for, for the fact that people don't trust experts. Again, some scientists have, have admitted to falsifying data. The doctor who claimed a link between autism and vaccines had his medical license revoked, his paper was retracted, he admitted to falsifying documents. Uh, Andrew Wakefield was his name. But you still, 20, 20 or 25 years later, you still, it was 1987, I think, 30 years later, we still read about people who are convinced that there's a link between autism and, um, and the MMR vaccine. I'll come back to that in a bit when I talk about particular examples. But I think we scientists are to blame for not policing each other better. And part of it has to do with pseudo-expertise, which has become kind of a fascination of mine. Oftentimes, people who are qualified and expert in one domain will start pontificating in another domain that they know nothing about. And it drives me crazy. Um, a famous local example, again, uh, William Shockley, Stanford professor who, run the, who won the Nobel Prize in physics. He shared it with two other researchers for inventing, co-inventing the transistor. Well, later in his life, William Shockley, PhD in physics, Nobel Prize in physics, developed deeply racist views about the genetic inferiority of a uh, subset of the American population. And he went around the country espousing these views, and people believed him. And they must have thought, oh my god, he's got a Nobel Prize. He must be really smart. Well, yes, in physics. <laughs> but he had no training in genetics 
or genealogy or cognitive assessment or any of the things he'd need to know. And, and he was, by the way, he was wrong, but we tended to believe him. And I'd like to point out that the PhD in physics doesn't even mean that he's an expert in other kinds of physics. He was a materials physics expert. I wouldn't have trusted him to start talking about cosmology or uh, about uh, string theory. Expertise, it turns out, is very narrow and it's domain specific. Occasionally you run into people who are expert in a couple of fields, but really when an expert's talking about something, um, you want to be sure that they are qualified and that their expertise is relevant. There are some funny examples of this. How many of you remember the claim hearing the ad campaign, four out of five dentists recommend Colgate? Famous ad campaign. Well, it turns out Colgate got sued for it. Uh, not because of pseudo-experts, but I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. I'll make the link in a moment. They got sued for it because of what the claim implies. To the average person, the court held, the claim that four out of five recommend Colgate is tantamount to saying that four out of five dentists prefer Colgate. But in fact, they don't. Part of critical thinking is we have to say to ourselves, what question were the dentists asked by the pollsters? Well, it turns out they were asked to list on a piece of paper as many toothpastes as they like that they recommend to their patients. And it turns out they listed Colgate and Crest and AIM and Aquafresh and Gleam and Arm and & Hammer and, you know, a whole bunch of toothpastes. I, it makes you wonder, what was that fifth dentist recommending, right? That you don't brush your teeth? Who knows? But the, the four out of five, it was sued, they had to stop doing the ads because it's a misleading claim. So when you encounter claims like that, um, you know, part of the Field Guide to Lies, the Weaponized Lies book, is to give every one of us some tools, easy to reach tools uh, that we can use when we hear a claim like that and, and know what questions to ask. So the first question to ask may not be this, but somewhere down the list, you want to, you know, if you hear the result of a survey, ask yourself, what question do you suppose these folks were asked? And if it's a good report, if it's a, you know, in a good newspaper or a good NPR report, or I mean, if somebody's written a good article on it, they'll tell you what the survey was. They'll reveal that. They show you what the questions were. But getting back to pseudo-experts, the thing that fascinates me about this is I'm not sure dentists are the right people to ask. Why do I say that? I've been going to dentists all my life. My dentist has never asked me what toothpaste I use. And I'm usually in a room and there's somebody in, in a room on either side of me and the dentist is you know, going around and visiting three people at once. And I've never, I've overheard his conversations. I've never heard him ask any other patient what toothpaste they use. So um, why is it that we think dentists are the right people to ask? And who would you ask? Well, you probably would want to get a scientist or a medical researcher to randomly assign toothpastes to a group of people, and then they use these different toothpastes and you follow them for a few years, and then you, you measure various outcomes of oral health, gingivitis, gum disease, bad breath, cavities, whatever it is, and then you've got your answer, right? That's a scientific study. Dentists, dentists aren't necessarily the ones to know. Shame on those dentists for answering the question in the first place. And shame on the rest of the dental community for not pointing out that dentists don't know the answer to this. Now, I'm kind of making fun of this because there's not a lot at stake. Which toothpaste you use doesn't seem to matter much, uh, according to science. And the recent report that even flossing doesn't seem to matter much. Uh, but it's not funny when people's lives are at stake. And there was a tragic consequence to this issue of pseudo-expertise when a young woman named Kelly Clark in England was on trial for murdering her infant. This was the second infant of hers that died. And in testimony, a pediatrician testified that the odds of both babies dying of natural causes uh, were phenomenally against her, that she had to have killed this baby, that the, the probability was, was um, you know, very, very, um, extremely significantly low that the, the baby could have died other than at her own hand. So she went to prison for three years. The whole time her husband worked to have her exonerated. He finally had um, some microbiological studies done of the infant's brain and it was found out that the infant had a congenital disease that killed it. Now we believed the dentists on the toothpaste because we think, ah, dentists, teeth, oral health, they would know, but they don't. 
We believe the pediatrician because we think, oh, infants, pediatrician, that's a baby doctor. But most pediatricians go an entire lifetime without ever seeing an infant mortality because fortunately infant mortalities are rare. The pediatrician's not the right one to ask. You'd have to ask a medical, a medical examiner, a coroner, or an epidemiologist, somebody trained in large population statistics of infant death. People who have seen hundreds or thousands of infant deaths. That's the right person to have testify. And if the defense attorney had been any good in Kelly Clark's case, he would have pointed that out and she wouldn't have had to spend three years in prison. Just imagine you're grieving over the loss of your second child and in the middle of the grieving process, actually in her case at the beginning of the grieving process, you're shackled and taken from your home and thrown in prison and then you're put on trial. It's just horrible. This is, this is another kind of, of um, consequence of a failure of thinking clearly about what's in front of our very eyes. Have an interest in conspiracy theories. Um, we can talk about that more later during the Q&A if you want. I don't want to get sidetracked. And, and certainly I believe there are conspiracies. I mean, Watergate was a conspiracy. It certainly seems to be the case that there was some conspiratorial aspect to the Kennedy assassination, if not the subsequent uh, investigation of it. There are conspiracies going on all around the world all the time. Uh, but there are probably not as many of them as some conspiracy theorists would think. And the, I think that part of critical thinking here is that a handful of unexplained anomalies doesn't discredit or undermine an established theory that's based on thousands of data points. And especially if you're talking about crime scenes, um, Crime scenes are really messy uh, in, in a real world case. And you can't recover every piece of the airplane. Uh, and you can't recover every body part from the people who were dismembered. And so you can't have a 100% investigation. There are always unanswered questions. But if you've got a well-formed theory that's corroborated and backed up by true experts, not pseudo experts, um, I think that you can, you can assume that you're probably on the right track. Uh, by, by the way, there are often many unanswered questions uh, because you know, the witnesses didn't see the entire thing or you know, the witnesses were at odd angles and different angles from one another and, and that contributes to it as well. I want to um, talk about a handful of tips that I cover in the book. Um, I, I'm grateful to you for inviting me to talk about the book. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about why I wrote it. I started writing it in 2001 because I was charged with the responsibility of teaching McGill honors students in psychology and neuroscience how to think critically. And um, I used a little book called How to Lie with Statistics, which I highly recommend. It was written by um, Daryl Huff. It's a thin little paperback. It's very amusing. The problem I had with the book was that most of the examples in it, it was written in the early 50s or late 40s, most of the examples come from like the U.S. Steel Annual Report from 1943 or um, you know, the Coolidge presidency. And I wanted to have more contemporary examples, so I asked my students to gather them from the media. And I ended up with boxes and boxes of these, and I started writing about them. And you know, I'm a bit of a procrastinator, so although I started the book in 2001, I wrote three other books in the meantime. But in 2014, after visiting you here to talk about the organized mind, a lot of the conversations I had here were about the critical thinking chapter in that book. And I thought, oh, well, I've got this old book on the back burner. I think that I'll, I'll, I'll double down and work on that. And I wanted it to be a kind of an updated how to lie with statistics, but I wanted it to be, to be very practical. No theory. There's nothing about brain science. It's just practical steps that any high school kid or any adult who's interested in this could follow uh, in order to arm yourself against the people who want to separate you from your money or deceive you or distort facts for their own means, you know, their own ends. Um, it, it really a, a toolkit that each of us can reach for um, that's simple to apply. So let me give you an example. I've already kind of um, talked in generalities about some of them. One of the powerful things is to check for plausibility. Right now, all you engineers know this. Um, plausibility is usually the first thing you want to look at with anything that has a number on it, 
because the number could just be ridiculous and then everything that follows you don't have to worry about. So I was in a taxi cab last fall. I was working in the back on my computer. Uh, and I have a little internet, remote internet uh, Wi-Fi device. And the taxi cab says, oh, the driver says, oh, you're on the internet. And I said, yes. He says, oh, I just read that there are 17 billion people in the world who lack internet access. And, you know, I, I'm not really an expert on the world population, but the last time I looked, it was hovering above 7 billion. It might even have been as high as 7.5. I don't really remember. I suppose it could have crept up to 8 billion since I looked, but I don't think it's at 17 billion. That's just not plausible, right? So, I mean, you can throw out a claim like that right away with just some real world knowledge. In fact, we had a very interesting conversation because I had just visited Google X where I was shown your balloon project, which is going to be uh, providing internet to Africans. Uh, he was very excited about it. I was very excited to tell about it. Um, and the interesting thing is I didn't contradict him at the beginning of the conversation because I could tell you know, he wanted to talk about this. And you know, I said, you know, it, it is a tragedy. There are a lot of people without internet. You'd think in this day and age, you know, internet, which is the great um, democratizing force that can help raise people out of ignorance and, uh, and such, uh, you know, it should be more widespread. So we had that conversation. And just as I got out of the cab, I said, oh, and by the way, I don't think it's 17 billion because there's only seven, seven and a half billion people in the world. At that point, he was receptive to being corrected. Uh, my younger self would have just said, oh, no, 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 you're wrong. Um, Here's another one. Um, this was actually um, published. The anti-marijuana initiative folks claimed that in the 35 years since California stopped enforcing its marijuana laws, the number of arrests for marijuana, uh, I'm sorry, the number of users, the number of marijuana users, in 35 years since marijuana laws stopped being enforced in California, the number of marijuana users has doubled every year. These are, for those of you who aren't chuckling, these are engineers chuckling uh, because they know what happens when you double a number for 35 times. And you can do this just by making a very simple assumption. Let's assume that 35 years ago, there was only one marijuana smoker in the entire state of California. I'm pretty sure there was more than one mar more marijuana smoker uh, in this very spot 35 years ago. But let's just say for the whole state there was only one and let's double that number every year for 35 years. Well, by the time you get to 35, you're up at that 17 billion I mentioned before. It's not plausible, more people than there are in the world. So throw that out. Um, very easy to do, check for plausibility. Um, more people died in plane crashes in 2014 than in 1960. Therefore, air travel is at unsafe levels, and you should stop traveling by air. It's, it's, one of the, it's, it's at one of the most unsafe levels in history. So, plausibility. Is it plausible that there were more airline, airplane crashes in 2014 than 1960? Yeah, that seems plausible. I'm not, I, I don't know, but it, it doesn't seem implausible. But wait a minute. Does the conclusion follow the premise? Right? Is the, are the data that they're citing actually relevant to the claim they're making? They're claiming that air travel is unsafe. It turns out that yes, there were more plane crashes in 2014, but there were a lot more flights than in 1960 and a lot more passengers. Uh, it, so the relevant statistic here isn't how many crashes, but how many crashes per thousand miles flown or how many crashes per thousand flights or how many fatalities per thousand miles flown, anything like that that scales so that you're dealing with you know, a proportion rather than raw numbers, you have to account for the fact that the world has changed. So um, we often find uh, that people, either because they're trying to deceive us or because they don't know better themselves, will bring up irrelevant facts. And a lot of public debate uh, goes around these kinds of well, this is true, so this must be true. And no, it, it, it's not true that that must be true. It, it doesn't necessarily follow. By the way, uh, for those of you that are fans of Sherlock Holmes and his famous uh, saying, deduction, my dear Watson, Sherlock Holmes does not engage in deduction. He engages in something called abduction, 
which is clever guesses that fit the facts. Deduction is something that has to be true, given the, the premises or the facts or the evidence that you've collected. That's not what he does, right? If you look carefully, most of the time, he's saying, well, I noticed that there is a cigarette burn on the left sleeve, which must mean that this person is right-handed, because it would be very difficult to burn your own sleeve uh, with your, you know, if you're smoking with the left hand, or you know, these kinds of things. That it's not deduction, it's abduction. Another uh, thing I'd like to remind you is that averages are distortions, by definition. Anytime you're looking at an average, it's a distortion, and it may not be telling you all that you really need to know. So I could tell you that there is a room next door, and the net worth, the average net worth of people in it, there's 10 people in there. Their average net worth is $5 billion. And if you're collecting for your favorite charity, or you're running a bake sale for your kid's school, or you're thinking of leaving Google and working for a startup, and if only you could get a little bit of money going, uh, you're thinking, well, 10 people, $5 billion apiece, I got to get in that room. But you know, it could be nine homeless people and Mark Zuckerberg, whose net worth is $50 billion, and it averages out to $5 billion each. The average is correct. Averages are a distortion because they don't tell you all you need to know. And what you should insist on having, of course, along with an average, is the range and some measure of the dispersion. So next time you encounter an average, if those things aren't reported, the range and the standard deviation or some measure of dispersion, uh, ignore it because it probably isn't very helpful. I think that Getting back to society, I think that we all need um, models of clear evidence-based thinking. And they're in short supply these days. Uh, we need them in the White House, in the courts, in the media. Uh, TV shows like Perry Mason, when I was growing up, they showed evidence-based thinking to a wide audience. Right? Perry Mason would try a case and uh, he'd prevent, present evidence, and then there'd be some surprising evidence from the defense or from the prosecutor. Yeah, he was the defense, the, he was the prosecutor. Uh, the judge would allow some evidence and not other evidence. Now, this was, this was entertainment. It wasn't an education, but it did model the very notion that evidence-based thinking is a thing, and it made it look attractive and sexy. Uh, whether you were a, a William F. Buckley um, fan or not, his television show, um, Crossfire, was it? Uh, that had civil discussion between people who disagreed about things, and they sticked close to what the evidence had to say. Their viewpoints might have differed, but you know, they were engaging in evidence-based thinking. I think we need better models for that. I'd like to see a site called that mirrors scholar.google.com. By the way, I've been telling everybody I know about it. I don't think you do a very good job of advertising it. But I tell people that if you go to scholar.google and you're looking for something about a scientific claim like, is echinacea really going to help me with my cold? Or I've just been prescribed this statin and I want to know what the side effects are. Rather than searching in regular Google, if people search in scholar.google.com, they end up getting um, a much narrower set of results that are primarily, as you know, from the peer-reviewed scientific literature. And so they're getting results that have been vetted in some sense, that are you know, much more helpful than just, you know, if you put in the name of a drug in regular Google, you could end up on the, site that, the website set up by the manufacturer of the drug. And there could be biases, of course. Or a site set up by the manufacturer of a competing drug who's trying to get you away from this one. Or a shill site like americansforbetterhealthcare.org, which really is run by Pfizer or something, right? I mean, Scholar.Google is this nice independent thing. And what I'd like to suggest um, that uh, Google do, in addition to scholar.google.com, I'd like to see evidence.google.com, where you can just type in anything like sex slave operation in pizza parlor, or um, who had the larger um, crowd at their inauguration. Uh, and evidence.google will, re will return just the evidence that weighs in on that issue, both sides. So that you know, the intelligent searcher, web user, can make up their own mind. Uh, but you would see by, you would I would imagine there'd be two columns, right? Evidence for, evidence against. And you could see by the quality and, and amount of evidence uh, where the needle tends to lean. 
Uh, every time I come here and make suggestions, I feel like you're all rolling your eyes in the back of your head, but <laughs> that's what I think. Last time I was here, I said that I thought that um, Google, um, regular Google search, uh, I had just been told in, my, in the lunch that I had before I came here last time that uh, Google was very proud of the fact that uh, when they first started out, well, when, when you first started out, uh, when Google was in a dorm room, effectively, and you, you searched Google in the early days, you had to scroll down quite a ways before you would find the thing you were really looking for. And Google has been working tirelessly, of course, to make the thing you're really looking for the first hit on the list so that you're not wasting time. And there's been a lot of discussion about how um, because Google knows your IP address, uh, whether you're signed in or not, and it knows your search history, it tends to tailor the results for you. So if um, I were to search for um, something uh, about climate change, I might get a very different result than you get searching about climate change, depending on the kinds of things we've clicked on in the past. I, I might never get any of your results, and you might never get any of mine. Uh, and so I wonder what you all think. I'd be curious to know your feelings about how or, or whether this has contributed to this echo chamber phenomenon that we've been accused of living in, this bubble phenomenon that we're only hearing views that support our own views. Uh, and we're not being exposed to what the great promise of the internet was. The great democratizing force was that for once and for all, we could have a free marketplace of ideas. You could encounter any idea that was out there and judge it for yourself. Uh, but that's getting harder and harder to do. Uh, and so last time I was here, I suggested that Google search should have uh, like the equivalent of the hyperspace button in asteroids, where every once in a while you would say, I, I don't want the stuff that you usually give me. I want to see something that's way out there. I want to see some stuff that I wouldn't normally see. Or maybe a little button that you could enable that says, I want to see the stuff you would normally give me, and I want to see the stuff that you would normally give someone else. Maybe someone chosen at random, or somebody who has a, a very different mathematically defined uh, higher dimensional manifold of search history than I do. And so I'm being exposed to ideas other than my own. Uh, I th when I said that two years ago, I, I, people could not have rolled their eyes any farther in the back of their heads. Possibly because I also opined that it'd be nice for Google Maps to have a scenic route button. Because when my wife and I go driving on Saturday afternoon to our favorite restaurant, we don't want the fastest way. We want the picturesque way. But I can never get Google Maps to help me find it. Again, this is, sorry for the little digression, but this is Google. I have the chance to say, say what I, I want to say. Uh, getting back to my main theme here, I think that there are three institutions that we all need to support. That's the take home message. The free press, scientific method, independent judiciary. I think that we need to work hard to support them, and we need to work hard to do for ourselves. Frankly, the media can't keep up with all the lies that are running around. They're working overtime. Fact-checking sites uh, aren't able to keep up with all the lies. So each of us has a responsibility, a personal responsibility, to figure out what's true and what's not, um, to think for ourselves. That is the basis of a free society. And I think to do that, um, the one most valuable quality that we all need, which unfortunately has been in somewhat short supply lately, is humility. I think we all need a little more humility. And I say that because somebody who thinks they know everything can't learn anything. But somebody who adopts a humble attitude that maybe I don't know everything, well, then you start asking questions, and you start looking at evidence, and you start seeking out experts who may know more than you. That's where true learning can take place, and that's where true evidence-based thinking can take place. And I think this comes down to education. I've devoted the last three decades of my life to being an educator, and I've seen that education works. And fortunately, it works across the spectrum. You don't have to have a high IQ for it to work. You don't need to be coming from a high socioeconomic background for education to work. It works with everybody. And the education, I think, needs to start with 12-year-olds teaching them things like when you land on a website, that's not the end of the research enterprise. That's only the beginning. You have to ask yourself who operates the website, if there are biases, who else links to it, are they trusted sources. Use the link tool in Google search to see what other 
um, sites are linked to it and whether they're reputable or not. Um, and I think all of this comes naturally to us, this kind of humility and question asking and inquisitiveness. Any of you who spend any time with a four-year-old at bedtime knows about this inquisitiveness, right? Because you say to the four-year-old, it's time to go to bed, and the four-year-old says, why? And then you say, well, it's your bedtime. Why? Well, we set your bedtime because you have school in the morning. Why? <laughs> because we want you to be rested for school. Why? You know, this goes on and on and on. This is a very natural human instinct and a phase that all children go through, but they have it beaten out of them. We have it beaten out of us by impatient teachers and impatient parents. Uh, it's often the grandparents who encourage it. Um, but I say, you know, that's a very natural human in inclination. Asking why is a good start. Again, I think we need to take communal responsibility. And I, I would like to recommend that you don't hit the thumbs up button on um, a story that you read in your social network. You don't forward it unless you've taken maybe 30 or 40 seconds to ask yourself whether it's true or not. Is it plausible? Uh, does, is the evidence that's being given for the claim actually, you know, is it relevant to the claim? Does it come from a good source, right? Um, I gave a talk in England a few weeks ago and a gentleman said to me, he says, you know, a lot of us voted for Brexit uh, because we believe this story, it turned out to be fake news, that uh, Britons were learning, losing 350 million pounds sterling a week by being in the EU, money that could otherwise have gone to the National Health Service. Over a billion pounds a month they were losing. And he says, it turned out to be false, but so many of us believed it. How, how could we have known? And I said, well, where did you read about it? He says, oh, we all read about it in the same place. It was written on the sides of buses going around town. And I said, did you read about it anywhere else? He says, no, but it was on the sides of the buses. Well, I said, if the only source that you have for something is the side of a bus or a man on the corner with a bullhorn and a sandwich board, right, it, it might not be true. And he says, oh, well, the media is part of a conspiracy. And I said, well, yeah, they are, maybe. But, you know, the, the media is also made up of people like you and me who are trying to earn a living and want to get ahead, maybe win a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, and if there's a real story out there, they're going to investigate it and they're going to publish it. And so you're going to get it sooner or later, most of the time, not to mention WikiLeaks, you know, exposing this kind of stuff. So, you know, there is a hierarchy of information sources, and I think we need to um, be sensitive to that and rely on it. It's just statistical. So thank you very much for your time. I'm very much looking forward to the comments that you might have to share with me. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. We've got a little bit of time for questions. I got one. Was it the side of a Google bus? No. <laughs> Is there any physiological evidence or any kind of study in the area um, or in your field uh, to suggest that there may be physical differences between people who uh, can evaluate um, uh, issues based on, you know, evidence, and those who can't? I have a couple of things to say about that. Um, on the, first of all, there's a new construct called the RQ. You've heard of the IQ, the intelligence quotient. This is the rationality quotient. And it turns out that the rationality quotient is not at all correlated with the intelligence quotient. You can have people that are very high in rationality that have low IQs and vice versa. Now, what I suspect is going on in the brain is that people who have poor impulse control and poor emotional control are more likely to jump to conclusions than to sit back and dispassionately let the evidence come in before they make a, uh, an evaluation. And this could have to do with configuration differences in the prefrontal cortex, the part of the human brain that's most highly advanced in humans compared to other species. Um, there's also an interesting link between um, political party and fake news. So it turns out for reasons, I'm not a sociologist, so I don't really know what underlies this, but a number of studies have shown that Republican voters are more likely to believe the fake news stories than Democratic voters. Now, it's probably being driven by underlying demographic differences between members of the two parties that uh, in general, 
um, Democrats tend to uh, have better education, and uh, but I mean certainly there are uneducated Democrats and very highly educated Republicans. I'm talking about as a group. There could be some demographic differences there. Republican voters tend to, although not exclusively, tend to be in more rural areas where they have less contact with a large number of people, and you know it's it's complicated. I was reminded of some of the analysis by Noam Chomsky on the media. And one of his comments w was uh, media organizations which are, in a sense, far from, uh, in a sense, what's going on tend to be a bit more objective and stick more to the facts. And he found that uh, compared to American media, uh, the, best, the best media that he was able to find was actually in Belgium. Um, now. Presumably, if you were at McGill for 17 years, you lived in Montreal. I, I'm a Canadian, and I read The Economist magazine. I don't rely on American media by and large. Um, what do you think, or can you give an opinion about how foreigners view uh, American events and, uh, I guess, foreign media relating on, on American politics in general? Would you think that they're because they don't have skin in the game, they don't have a bias, they don't have a motivation, that they're actually more objective and fair? Well, I will answer the question, but first I'd like to say that I am not an expert on this, and I don't want to become a pseudo-expert here. I don't have expertise in media studies or communication or sociology or political science. People in those fields might have a better bead on this. I can speak as a private citizen, uh, just my own views. By the way, um, you may say, well, what's a neuroscientist doing talking about statistics? I am a member of the American Statistical Association, and I've published papers in statistical journals, and I've taught statistics. So, and I had um, 40 members of the American Statistical Association review the book before it went to press. Uh, so I've been, I've been trying to be very careful not to become a pseudo-expert. Um, I think that... Um, Certainly, there are some great uh, foreign newspapers and magazines and, you know, the BBC, great uh, news network. I, I think that we don't all have time to read, you know, six or eight newspapers a day. I think you can just choose one that you like for whatever reason or two uh, uh, or, or, or broadcast news and stick with it and just figure that the major stories are going to be reported there. Now, you know, a news source based in Belgium or in London may not pick up on the fact that the Oroville Dam was about to collapse uh, or that you know, the water table here in Northern California is finally restored after X years of drought. But you know, the big things they'll get, and if you want some local color, you read the Mercury News or something. But I, I don't know whether they're more objective because they don't have skin in the game. Most of what you said about uh, arguing for evidence-based reasoning and uh, advocating for the media and uh, uh, judiciary and science are sounds pretty reasonable to me. What kind of objections do you get from, do people object to these ideas? Yes, they do, vehemently. They say um, evidence-based thinking is just for a bunch of poindexters and eggheads. And, you know, I don't trust you people. You people have kept people like me out of the workplace, or I don't have the job I want, or I'm only working part-time. And, um, you know, you coastal lefties, you know, talk about evidence, you know, well, I don't have a job. Um, and, or, you know, um, you scientists can't make up your minds. Every time I pick up the newspaper to figure out what to eat, I hear a different story. And so you can't, if I can't trust you about that, how can I trust you about anything? And I read that three scientists who were saying that um, climate change is real um, we're being bribed to say it, you know, so I can't trust any of it. I'm just going with my gut. That's one of the big objections. And the other objection I get is that there's a conspiracy and that I'm part of it and I'm being paid off. Uh, and, you know, I suppose, but I don't think I'd be driving a 10-year-old car if that were true. And I, I actually say that. I say, come with me to the parking lot. I'll show you my 10-year-old car. And they say, oh, well, you probably have a fancy car in the garage. You know, I mean, just, you, know, you can't win with a conspiracy theorist because there's always some other level. Thanks for coming to Talks at Google. Thank and you. Thank you, Dan. <laughs>